perhaps maybe miss um, some of that stuff. Um, and when we kind of start to fall off the wagon a little bit and things aren't kind of quite going as, as well as what we'd hoped, we're not getting the results that maybe we've seen other people get um, in terms of their uh, low-carb paleo approach, it might be that we're not necessarily reducing some of these um, aspects. And all of those things are sort of very, very human aspects. You know, they're, they're part of us as a species. They're, they're things that we need to address. They're um, just as compulsory for us as uh, breathing and food. Um, in our society, though, we tend to champion this guy. And this guy's a bit of a hero to us. And we probably all know people like that. Um, now this is the guy who is still sending out work emails at half past 10, um, 11 o'clock at night. Um, I'm, is this, being, this is being video recorded, isn't it? So I can't slake my boss off. Um, he's really bad at this. Sorry, Brad. Um, so, you know, people are up, up late at night, and then there's still the ones who are up at 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock to make the, the first class in the morning at the at the gym or wherever they go to. Um, these are heroes. You know, these are the guys that um, refer to sleep as just being a caffeine deficiency. You know, we kind of celebrate but we kind of wish that you know, we could be like him because we could fit more things in during the, during the day. Um, this is why I tend to think of those people. <laughs> um, when we look at sleep restriction, we've, we've got to look at the hormones that, that go with it. There's been quite a bit of research uh, around this area, so um, if you ever want to go and use um, Dr. Gurgler is just going to put in sleep restriction and carbohydrates will be a massive number of um, hits in terms of the, the research around this area. And there's a big, there's a good reason for that, that research and that there's a massive overlap between some of the hormones that um, go with over consumption of carbohydrate and uh, a lack of sleep. Um, two or three of the hormones in particular, so we've got um, up the top of the ghrelin, which is a um, hunger stimulating hormone. So if you don't get enough sleep, then your appetite goes up you actually have a desire for more food. We've probably, most of us have experienced that, and we've had a couple of rough nights sleep, we tend to kind of turn into eating machines after um, two or three days, for, for no reason um, other than our hormones are going up. And then we've got these other uh, two hormones, the GLP and leptin, and they're our satiety hormones, so they're the two hormones that tell us they're actually full, um, and they decrease. So, appetite gets ramped up, um, sensations of fullness or feelings of fullness go down when you're sleep deprived. So, Bad news if you try and control your appetite uh, and your food intake. Uh, we also see that length of sleep, which is probably primarily most people's focus when they, they start to think about sleep, they're thinking about how long they're sleeping for. Um, so le length of sleep, but also time in deep sleep and, and REM sleep, so or dream sleep. Probably the most important period of sleep that you can get is the first three hours, because that's when you drop into deep sleep, um, and that's when you get your biggest growth hormone release, and that controls a lot of the downstream um, effects on your biology. So when we're, we're trying to get people to sleep better, we're really pushing that first three hours and making sure that we're um, <coughs> achieving that. So both uh, length of sleep and time of sleep um, has, has the problems if we're not getting enough of, of each one. So uh, we get a decrease in metabolic rate, increase in hunger, and our food intake goes up, and we especially tend to gravitate more towards carbs. So I mean, who, who's experienced that? Had a, had a couple of rough nights sleep, we just want carbs, give me sugar. Preferably mixed in a bucket of caffeine. Yes. <laughs> um, one of the things we see is that our impulse control um, is low and we get delayed gratification of the sleep deprivation. Um, and this makes us a little bit more vulnerable when we see things that start to get a little bit tempting for us. So if, if we've had a good night's sleep and our diet's been pretty well under control, we're, we're going well, we can often you know, push away some of the temptations that we're all, we're all faced with. I mean, at the end of the day, all of us kind of eating this kind of healthy food are freaks. Um, when we go into our workplaces, we're faced with all, all sorts of things. And um, again, Anastasia coming out of the hospital constantly has a rant at me about the number of cup cupcakes floating around those places. So, um, when we're sleep deprived, our resistance to those temptations drop. So what happens when we're suddenly put in this, this scenario? Is our inability to say no to the cupcake or the donor, is it because we lack willpower? We're just not strong enough, we're a bit you know, weak up here, or is it we just haven't had enough sleep for a few days? And it's good, good chances related to the sleep. Um, after four days in a row of inadequate sleep, our abdominal fat cells become more insulin resistant and we lose our insulin sensitivity. So we lose our ability to tolerate, tolerate carbohydrate in our diet on sleep deprivation. Now, uh, last time I calculated, most of us are probably doing a minimum of five days a week um, as far as work goes. Uh, so that's five sleeps that are probably not quite long enough. Um, and you can see up there four days in a row is enough to um, switch that system, uh, that uh, insulin resistance system on. Um, so that's bad news. So 
you know, when we're trying to manage our insulin resistance and insulin sensitivity through carbohydrate alone, just how low do we have to screw it down when we're sleep deprived? Do we perhaps have to go lower carb than probably what is comfortable just because we're not getting up out in, in the bed? Um, when we are losing weight, um, but we're sleep deprived, disproportionately that weight will come out of your lean mass. So you tend to lose more muscle than you do body fat when you're in a sleep deprived state. Um, just one of the studies, you can see down the bottom there, uh, for the subjects that were on less than 6 hours a night, uh, they lost a little over half a kg of fat during a period of the study, but they lost nearly 2.5 kg of lean, lean tissue. Uh, compared to those who were getting more than um, 8 hours a night, and the, the split between fat and lean tissue was fairly even. So yes, the number in the scales might be tracking down, you might be sleeping 5.5 hours a night, and you're kind of happy because the weight loss is working, but where's it coming from? And is that going to catch up on you at a later date? And odds on it will. So again, when people come in and see us and sort of say, you know, I've tried this low carb thing or I've tried this paleo thing and it, it didn't work and my weight rebounded back, <coughs> what can I do? Do I just need to do it harder? Am, am I weak? Those sorts of things. So maybe it's a food issue, but maybe it's not. Um, sleep de deprivation is a potent disruptor of many metabolic processes involved in any re energy regulation, especially carbohydrate metabolism. So again, are we in a situation where we really need to keep focusing on carbohydrate all the time, or do we look outside of that for some of these other things? Now, we need to be very, very careful with our reductionist thinking. Now, we've all been exposed to the whole dietary fat thing for, for many, many years now, and we still are to a degree. And that, in fairly loose terms, says that dietary fat causes disruptions in our body fat metabolism. And we know that's not true. And you've probably heard many excellent speakers over the, the course of the day saying that we shouldn't fear fat the way we have done historically. But at the same time, we also need to be very, very careful that we don't make the same mistake with, with carbohydrates, that we don't position them as the absolute evil that we have with, with fat. Yes, we all probably eat far too many of them in our um, modern society, but we can't reduce it down and say that problems with carbohydrate metabolism internally are a result of dietary carbohydrate. And that, I think that's probably be one of the shifts, um, certainly within the paleo framework, has been um, over the last year, 18 months, is that we're sort of starting to relax a little bit around the carbohydrates, certainly not going back up to um, Western diet um, levels, but possibly not screwing them down as tightly as what we have done uh, right at the start. Um, so we come back to this. So I'd say sleep deprivation is not fixed in the kitchen. So we need to be very, very careful that we're not trying to address other issues, we're not trying to address some of the other stuff that's going on in our life with food. And perhaps when you know, we've only got enough time and enough energy for a singular focus, it, it is too easy to kind of get trapped in the, the whole diet mode. Um, and, and equally, you know, we can't fix things with exercise and, and sleep deprivation, certainly not something that's going to be fixed in the gym. Um, by the way, goldfish totally paleo too. <laughs> um, as far as getting a good night's sleep uh, goes, one of the things that we try and coach people is not to try and get a good night's sleep or prepare for their good night's sleep just as they climb into bed. Um, people often sort of say, oh, how, how do I get good night's sleep? And I try and try and sleep more, but I just can't sleep particularly well. Your good night's sleep starts pretty much as soon as you wake up in the morning. So we've got up there, you need to see the sunlight. You need to get bright light in your eyes. We've got two key hormones which regulate our sleep patterns overall, cortisol and melatonin. Cortisol is the hormone that wakes you up in the morning. Melatonin is the hormone that puts you to sleep. To have those two hormones run in a, a fairly good cycle between the, the two of them and to run efficiently, you need to get bright light in your eyes to wake you up in the morning. And that, that sets your melatonin pulse for, for later on. So you're talking about something that's occurring probably at least 12 hours out before going to bed. Um, we need to kill the caffeine. We've got all sorts of uh, sources of caffeine going into our diet. Um, some people tend to tolerate, uh, tolerate it a little bit better than others. But generally speaking, caffeine within our system has a half-life of about six hours. So it takes about six hours to run whatever dose of caffeine you've got currently circulating around down by about a half. Uh, if you're constantly chugging away on the coffee all day, um, every day you can get to the point where nine o'clock at night you've still got the equivalent of a long black circulating around your system. Now people say, oh, but you like to get to sleep. It's not about getting to sleep, it's about staying asleep, and it's about dropping through your sleep cycles is about getting that good deep sleep through the first three hours. And yes, you might be able to drop into stage one, stage two sleep with some 
caffeine still circulating around your system, but can you drop right down in stage four deep sleep? And that's the key difference. Um, and we need to a uh, blue light blackout as well. So blue light to our eyes and blue lights thrown out by those things there and these things here in particular. Um, as far as these things are concerned and the receptors in your eyes are concerned, this is staring at the sun. So if you're working on a laptop or twittering away five minutes before we go to, before you go to bed, you're staring at the sun. And remember that the sun tells you to wake up. So we need to kind of kill our um, you know, little play things just before we go to bed.